Welcome to Creative Mornings Gurugram. Uh, so this is the second session of Creative Mornings. So Creative Morning is a global event. Uh, it's a free monthly breakfast series and it happens all over the world in 170 cities. In India it is happening in three cities, uh, Mumbai, Bangalore and last month we started in Gurgaon. So Creative Mornings uh, is globally supported by MailChimp, Wix.com and Shutterstock. So over here, uh, Creative Mornings Gurugram is supported by 91 Springboard and Sapien Razorfish. And we have Jai Kanayan who will be talking about how a motorcycle journey changed his life. So Jai is a clean tech entrepreneur and motorcycle adventurer who in 2000 set off from Chicago on a three year overland journey across Latin America, Europe and Africa before ending up in India. He covered over 64,000 miles across 33 countries on five continents, cooking 56 chicken curries along the way. Uh, Jai's solo journey took him across vibrant cultures and mind expanding wilderness. He rolled across the Amazon rainforest, the vast emptiness of Patagonia, the desert of the Sahara, and the majestic Himalaya. So what to you, Jay? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming here on a Friday morning. And thanks to the Creative Mornings team for inviting me to speak at this unique platform. Once again, my name is Jay Kanayan, and I'm going to be sharing with you about a motorcycle journey that took me from the US to India on a one-way trip home. Now this month's theme at Creative Mornings is about survival and my trip was literally about survival on the road and also figuratively in my life. Uh, let's get a, a few trip stats. As uh, someone was saying, the journey lasted about three years and three months. I traveled through 33 countries, rode a bit over 100,000 kilometers and cooked 56 chicken curries along the way. A bit of backstory, I'm from the Madras area, but grew up in Zambia in Africa when I was young. And then after doing schooling in Tamil Nadu, went to the US to do engineering, got a cushy corporate job doing product design in Chicago, and uh, at the same time got into motorcycles. Initially for fun, but pretty soon started traveling. Weekend trips became 10 day trips that led to this three week trip to Alaska in 2008 and then Mexico, Canada, all over the US. And it was becoming apparent to me that whenever I was on the road, on the bike, I felt like my life was on play. But when I would come home and go to office and run this cycle, I felt like my life was on pause. So that was signaling to me that I needed to go on a long journey. But was this even possible? How could I do this on an e-passport? You know, how much money was this going to cost? And how could I tell my parents? So by March of 2010, everything fell into place. I quit my job, sold my house, car, and most other worldly possessions besides what fit on the bike, and the journey began. This is a, a route map of my overall trip from Chicago, went down through South America. That took about a year. And then across the Atlantic to Europe, down into Africa, about two years down uh, to South Africa and then on another ship to Madras, then Kanyakumari to Cargill, and the journey ended in Delhi. Now, this was a solo journey, but it wasn't just me on the road. I felt there was two of us, me and my motorcycle. Her name is Sandrina. She is a really old school 1998 Suzuki DR650 dirt bike. Now, why this kind of bike? Because, um, I, when I bought this bike, she was already 10 years old, and she already had 30,000 kilometers on her. Now, many people were saying, Jay, that's really foolish. You should buy a brand new bike for this kind of trip. And I said, actually, that doesn't make sense, because any vehicle you get is going to break down over time. So accepting that at the beginning, I decided that whatever bike I had was definitely going to break down. I might as well get a simple bike that I can learn how to fix, fix myself. You know, new bikes these days come with so many electronics and computers, you need a laptop almost to diagnose. This is an old school bike, very few electronics. 
I actually spent about three, four years learning about this one how to fix it, how to maintain it, and sat with mechanics, having them teach me how to maintain a bike. So this was a long process on the way. And um, so I managed to outfit Sandrina with these uh, three big boxes on her. One box had my clothes and toiletries. Another box had tools and spare parts. And then the top box had a camera, laptop, camping gear, cooking stove, all minimalist. I traveled with one pair of cargo pants for three years and about three or four t-shirts. You know, surprisingly, when you're traveling, people will forgive you if you're wearing the same clothes every day. You know, as long as you're moving from place to place, it doesn't matter if you're wearing the same clothes. So this is also an exercise in minimalism. How little can you live with? You know, when I got to Delhi, within the first month, I bought three pairs of shoes because you need formals, you need sneakers, you need chapels. But on the trip, one pair of sandals was enough, right? So that was a nice experience. And Sandrina was also more than a motorcycle. She was my home on the road. She was my connection to survival. It was always about, is Sandrina in a safe place tonight? If she ever got stolen, everything I had in the world was stolen. So it was first about figuring out how she could be safe, then I would be safe as well. I also managed to stash some uh, safe money in different places on the bike so that in case I ever got robbed or my hotel room got robbed, there would be something on the bike. But only now at the end of the trip do I tell people where I stash that money. So I'll tell you about that later. So the journey started and one of the big reasons for going on a trip like this was to escape from our concrete civilization and go spend more time in wild nature. And having a motorcycle allows you to travel through the jungle and all these small roads to arrive at these limestone pools in the middle of the rainforest in Guatemala. Continued on through Central America, reached Panama, and if you see on the map, you'll see that North and South America are connected by land. But actually, there's no road that connects them. The road ends in Panama and starts again in Colombia. Because there's this short section called the Darien Gap, where it's just covered in thick jungles and swamps and there's rebels and drug trade and it's pretty a crazy place. So for travelers, the only option is to fly, which is expensive, or by ship, which is a more romantic way to travel. So here Sandrina is being lifted from a canoe that brought us from the shore onto this 100-foot sailing boat that took us from Panama to Colombia and South America. Now, one of the other big uh, reasons for going on this trip was to discover what food means for people in different cultures. And in Ecuador, it's a whole roasted pig on the roadside. I'm sorry if you're vegetarian or you're Muslim and you're squeamish, but you know, to people, you need to have an open mind and accept that people have different beliefs from you. And uh, if you're also vegetarian, this kind of trip is probably going to be difficult because you need to eat whatever you find along the way. And uh, you pull up to here, they take some pork out of the back, roast it up, put some sauce, and you know, that's lunch. Carried on into Peru, and um, this was a self-funded trip. So I had to figure out creative ways on how to extend my dollars as much as possible. And one way I did that was staying with local hosts along the way. For one thing, it was a free stay, but also it was an interesting insight into these different local communities. Instead of just being a tourist and staying in hotels and hostels and being anonymous, I was staying in communities and getting a slice of their life. So one of these guys that um, if, you, if you stay with me, you have to speak to my computer class that I teach in this village. I said, sure, no problem, but it's in Spanish. And I only started learning Spanish after the journey began by staying with people and using language tapes. So this is three months into my trip. Uh, Spanish wasn't that great but I managed to entertain these kids for about half an hour, explaining to them where India was. They didn't know India, but they knew China. I'm like, yeah, next to China, so they got the connection. And uh, also managed to explain how, you know, we're from other parts of the world, but we're both brown-skinned. So there must be some connection. And uh, we, we, had a good, uh, we had a good feeling there. Continued on and uh, into northern Peru. These were the parts of the trip that I was really living for, getting away from it all, finding these remote roads in rural 
places in the, in the Andes. And uh, here's a video from a GoPro on my helmet. This is at about 10,000 feet in the Andes. Uh, the road is just cut straight into the mountainside, no guardrails. You can't freak out. You can't be tense. You have to be really calm. And actually, if you face fears like this and you get over them, you can actually start enjoying it. And you realize there's way more enjoyment in life if you can keep your fears in check. And um, yeah, a lot of good, exciting roads like this along the way. Then got into Bolivia. And uh, in rural places, I was wild camping a lot more. And it's strange, actually, how in cities and urban spaces, I feel more unsafe. I want to get a hotel guarded and looking out my belongings. When I'm in rural places, I feel really calm and safe. And that's applicable, I think, almost anywhere in the world. So in northern Bolivia, pulled up to this village, asked the villagers if I could camp somewhere. They pointed at this tree. And I said, oh, there's a bunch of pigs lying there. I'm like, OK, they shooed away the pigs. I set up my camp, and the pigs came back and claimed their spot. So that night, I slept with the pigs. Crossed into Brazil to ride this one amazing road called the Trans-Amazonica. It's a dirt track that cuts across the whole Amazon rainforest from the west to the east. And what was actually really sad was to see how much of the Amazon is up in flames today every day. You might read the statistics that you know, we're losing the size of Switzerland every year in the rainforest, but when you see it with your own eyes going up in flames, it really drives home how much our current lifestyle is hurting the planet. Got to the coast in Brazil and uh, rode down to Rio de Janeiro, and this is really one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Within city limits, they have beaches, lakes, lagoons, uh, tunnels, rainforests, really gorgeous place. I think I would like to retire there someday. Then got to Sao Paulo, was staying with a bunch of journalists and uh, through couchsurfing. And the way couchsurfing works is um, you create a profile about yourself. You go find hosts in different cities. And you send a request to them if you can stay with them. Then they read your profile. If you sound like an interesting guy, sure. Because it's a free thing, and it's meant to create exchange and stories, cross-cultural exchange. And to make the request easier, I would tell them, hey, and if I can stay with you, I'll cook this chicken curry for you. So of course, it became this you know, event almost. Here's this bald Indian guy in a motorcycle cooking a chicken curry in my house. And I figured out a simple recipe on how to make a tasty curry on the road without too many ingredients, just using a lot of onions and garlic and ginger. And uh, I actually had spices, garam masala, that my mom would make in Madras and airlift to me at different places along the trip. That's how important this curry was to my journey. And uh, it became such a phenomena that after staying with people in couchsurfing, they would write a reference on my profile, or Jay stayed with me and his curry was, was really great, that people started seeing that I was coming to this next city, say Buenos Aires, and they'd be like, hey, Jay, you need to come stay in my house and cook this curry for me and my family. So I realized the reputation of my curry was preceding me on this trip. Got back to Bolivia to ride this one really amazing natural phenomena on our planet. It's called the Salar de Uni. It's a salt lake, white, 10,000 square kilometers flat at 12,000 feet in the mountains in Bolivia. And what's really amazing on a motorcycle is that there are no reference points on the horizon. So if you're on a bike, I'm here standing on the foot legs going about 100 kilometers get up there, and then I close my eyes. And how long can you do that? 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, open your eyes, and you feel like nothing's changed, but you've just covered so many kilometers. Really amazing experience. Very few places in the world you can do this. I think you can do this in the run of Kutch, but uh, I haven't been there yet. So very, very trippy experience. Then got into Argentina, and uh, Argentina today is the more developed, more expensive country, and Argentina is a little poorer, but Argentina is safer than Chile. Chileans would even tell me, don't wild camp in Chile, you'll get robbed. Argentinians were like, you can wild camp anywhere, there's a really good feeling. And I felt, whenever I tell people I'm Indian, there was some strong connection. I don't know where it comes from, but uh, maybe from decades ago, Argentina and India have uh, good relations. So, pulled up to this country house, 
asked the caretaker if I could set up camp in their front yard, no problem. He gave me firewood, gave me five liters of water for the night. I used two liters to take a bath and the others to clean and cook. And then, uh, that's my petrol stove over there. Just made a simple meal of you know, rice, tomato sauce, some soy chop. You know? So this is a good hearty protein you can carry with you anywhere. And then just very simple, create a fire, tend to the fire through the night. No internet, no mobile, no connection, feeling really satisfied and content with life in these kind of places. Continued on to Patagonia to see this uh, amazing natural phenomenon called the Perito Moreno Glacier. You might be aware now, you know, due to climate change and global warming, most of the glaciers in the world are retreating. I think all the glaciers in the Himalayas are retreating. But this is one of the few glaciers in the world that's still growing, and scientists don't understand why. So that brought us to the mouth of the glacier. This is about uh, the ice is sticking out about 300 feet from the water and it goes down a couple thousand feet below this. And we'd wait about 10 minutes, then we'd hear and a piece of ice would break off and come crashing down into the water. And everybody on the boat just breaks out in applause because you feel like you've just witnessed this really amazing natural phenomenon. A very strong spiritual experience actually. Then I uh, got to Buenos Aires and boarded this cargo ship with Sandrina for the uh, journey across the Atlantic. This was a one-month trip across this, uh, on this cargo, cargo ship. It wasn't a cruise ship. There was no entertainment. We were with the crew, a few passengers. And uh, every night after dinner, I would come up and sit on the deck and just uh, take in the view. And you know, for the same money, I could have taken a flight for me and Sandrina to do the trip in 10 hours or do the trip in four weeks. And to go slowly, to travel slowly, it gives you perspective about you know, your place on the and first, of course, the obvious thing is how much of our world is covered in water. You don't realize it, but we're all land-dwelling creatures. And land makes up you know, almost a quarter of our planet. And the majority is just water. But we usually don't even get to see that or experience that. But sitting on the ship here at night, uh, are you familiar with the uh, constellation in the sky called Orion? Right? Uh, in our northern hemisphere, he's got four stars, a belt, and a sword. So he's a hunter. But actually in the southern hemisphere, he's upside down. So his sword looks like a tie. So every night at 9 o'clock, I would look up and see where's Orion in the sky. And in the southern hemisphere, he was upside down. When we got up to the equator, he was right above head. When we got to the northern hemisphere, he was back having a sword. And it dawned on me then that we had just pivoted under the stars. You know, we moved as the earth through the stars. Sitting here on the earth, we think the sun and the stars are moving. They're not. It's actually us that's moving. And I'm sure we might know this from physics and our science classes, but to experience this slowly really drives home this kind of message. So I'd really encourage you when you're traveling or planning your trip, travel slowly. You know, try not to see 20 countries in 10 days, but maybe just two places over those 10 days and really get to know them deeply. Got to Europe. Uh, Europe was just a pit stop for me to pick up a new passport, more visas, get paperwork done for Sandrina, crossing the Alps, and um, there's some really beautiful roads there. I mean, I think these guys have figured out how to create gorgeous roads, not just a road for A to B, but to actually make it a fun journey to, to travel through there. And um, you can see I have a GPS on there. Before, there were smartphones that made GPS so convenient. You needed a real GPS unit. And uh, crossed uh, Switzerland into Italy, and then took a ferry down to Egypt. Now, this is in 2011, when the Arab Spring was getting going across the Middle East. So I was in Europe, seeing what was happening in North Africa. And my initial plan was to go through Morocco. But I couldn't get a visa for Morocco on an Indian passport. So then it became to get into Egypt. But the overland route through the Middle East and Syria was getting closed off because the Syrian war was getting started at that time. Libya was also starting its own war by that time. So Egypt became this only entry I had into Africa. And surprisingly, if you would read just the news, you would think Egypt was a complete mess by the focus on all the violence and the protests. And you realize then that news is actually just sensationalizing a very small aspect of a country. 
right? Um, I got information from Couchsurfing host in Cairo that actually, if you avoid Tahrir Square, everything is calm and safe in Egypt. And, but everybody else, all the other tourists, was seeing the news and running away from Egypt. So you can see here, I'm at the pyramids, one of the most touristed sites in the world. Nobody is there. So I have all the amazing sites in Egypt, almost all to myself. So for travel tip, visit a country just after revolution. Keep, a, keep an eye on Syria. As soon as things become calm there, book a flight and go there. Check it out before all the tourists get there. Continued through Egypt and got into Sudan. And Sudan is also these, one of these countries that if you just read the news, you would think it's complete hell. Yes, there's a lot of war in South Sudan and Darfur, but Sudan's actually a massive country. And Northern Sudan is very safe, very calm. I was actually wild camping a lot in Sudan. And uh, so I set up camp one night next to the Nile. And these two fishermen on the right came up to me with the uh, universal signal for come eat. Went and joined them, but uh, they were speaking Arabic. I only knew a few phrases, so we couldn't communicate much. I didn't know wh what was happening. And then this guy in the jeans shows up, Mohammed, speaking English. And I said, oh, you speak English, great, explain to me what's going on. Found out his story. He's from Khartoum, but he actually studied pharmacy in Chennai, in the medical college, next to my parents' home. And actually in the same college my sister went to for her MBBS. So that is, what's the chance of meeting some, someone randomly in the Sahara who's almost been to my home in, in Madras? So he invited me then to Saleh, the, the head fisherman, and I stayed in his house for about five days. They're out here in the desert. This was in the summer. We think we have a hot summer in Delhi. It reached 53 Celsius there every day, every afternoon. No electricity, completely off the grid, just really thick mud walls. And look at that, they're drinking sweet mint tea. I'm here like this fool drinking seven liters of water trying to stay hydrated, and they're just drinking sweet mint tea. You know, they figured these things out, how to live with nature, not how to fight against it. So, and they had quite a thriving lifestyle. You know, the Nile is actually very fertile, right next to it. They had dates, okra, bengen, goats, pigeons, really good life without any need for cash. But this guy, Mohammed now, he was actually buying fish from these fishermen into Khartoum and giving them cash. Because actually for him, selling fish was more lucrative than his pharmacy degree. You know, I don't know, it doesn't work out in Khartoum. So now what are these people doing with their newfound cash? Buying recharge minutes for their mobile phones. Because before phones, they might have only visited their neighbors and relatives, you know, in the next village, maybe once a year. Now, every day, they're on the phone constantly getting updates and it's changed their social life, you know. It's pretty interesting coming from the mobile sector, seeing how technology is changing cultures across the world. Hopefully for them. So I uh, continued on, got into Ethiopia, which is uh, another really amazing country. There's a direct flight from Delhi to Addis Ababa, even that much. Next time you're planning a trip, think about just even a weekend trip to Addis. It's a really, really gorgeous place. So, if you're traveling through East Africa, you can actually stay on paved roads the whole way from Egypt to South Africa, except for one stretch between southern Ethiopia and northern Kenya. There's a route called the Turkana route. It's about 900 kilometers of off-road, and that's much longer than I can go on Sandrina. So I had to team up with other overland travelers to carry extra petrol for me in exchange for chicken curry. And uh, we're just reaching the end of the tarmac in Ethiopia here, and we came across this huge that had just been run over by a truck or something. And uh, you can see I got up close to it for this photo, and even though it's clearly dead, I'm scared to get any closer to it. And I blame our TV culture that has demonized snakes. For what reason? Right? They're just another animal. They're not all out to kill us or strangle us. But this is the effect that you no know, cultural psyche has on us. And uh, what was really scary was that night I was planning to wild camp just a few hundred kilometers from here, thinking, holy shit, is this a smart decision? Uh, there might be pythons coming to my tent. But uh, it was okay, I survived. And then this is a bit of, uh, let me adjust the video. Traveling through Lake Turkana, it's a really dry part of the world. Um, and I'm riding with another biker, Carlos from Spain. and. Um, 
So Sandrina, you know, she's a really good bike. She can do off-road, on-road, whatever you throw at it. Not, not a very fussy bike. And uh, my, ma my mother would ask me, what do you do all day on the bike? Aren't you bored? I'm like, actually, no, mom. You know, you pay attention to the small changes in the landscape. So we're in the desert, moving away. The landscape is changing slowly. And uh, can you believe, you know, this is a road. It's a bunch of boulders up a hillside. And you need to just figure out how to crawl over them. And um, so riding a motorcycle can be fun. But yes, it is dangerous. And accidents do happen. And uh, I just caught a rock at a wrong angle, and we went crashing down into this bush. But if you can see, I'm covered head to toe in this helmet, gloves, Kevlar jacket and pants, boots, and not a single scratch on me. I've had maybe about 10 to 12 accidents on this trip, not a single injury. And even Sandrina, very simple, very strong bike, no problem. I think these days with you know, fancy bikes, you have one crash, all the plastics are broken, and you're out, lacks of money. You know? so, Keep it simple. Got into Nairobi, and uh, there was actually an incident a few years ago where uh, the communities that were living harmoniously in Kenya suddenly started fighting with each other because you know their, their leaders made some noise about it. So there was actually this American NGO teaching yoga for free to Kenyans, hoping to create yoga teachers so that they would take yoga further into their communities to bring more harmony back. So for me as an Indian to witness this is very strange. American teaching Africans yoga. But okay, this is a phenomena that's you know grown beyond India right now. Then I continued through East Africa and this was my childhood home in Zambia. We lived there in the uh, through the 80s and this was an old colonial home. I didn't know if it would still be there 20 years later, but uh, pulled up to it and realized that it had been converted now into a heritage motel and uh, walked into the front desk and I told the guy, hey, this used to be my home, can I stay for free? Like, nope, $25 a night. So, stayed for two nights, but managed to sleep in my old bedroom and uh, call mom from there on Skype and she was really thrilled. And it was, it was very, it's very interesting to go back and relive these old memories, but also sometimes maybe it's not idea, because when I was small, this house was huge. It would take me many steps to run from my room to my parents' bedroom. But now as an adult, you know, two steps and I'm there. So sometimes it diminishes these really grand memories that we had. But a uh, very, very rich experience. I'm glad I got to go back. Continued on to Lusaka in Zambia to meet this girl, Abigail. I'd been sponsoring her through this charity called Children International, where for about $20 a month, you can support one child and help move them out of poverty and their family as well. So it's a different strategy. Instead of just giving generally to an organization and saying, you do what you want with it, it was allowing sponsors to directly connect with someone. And uh, I chose Zambia because I wanted to give back to the country for the really amazing childhood I had there. And then uh, when I got here, I mean, she's seven years old. I don't know if she understood what was going on. But then um, when I was young, my pet name was actually Abby. And when I heard her mom refer to her as Abby, for Abigail, I realized this was meant to be. There was a nice connection. Continued into Namibia, and uh, this is a woman from the Himba tribe. They live out in the desert. It's a pretty harsh environment. And they cover themselves in this red ochre mud to protect from the elements. And uh, this is an eco run by the Himba tribe. So you can see Sandrina's in the background there, and as I do once in a while, I would clear out all my belongings and throw away things I'm not using. So I had this spice shaker that I bought from Walmart that had these, you know, six compartments, salt, pepper, chili powder, whatnot. I wasn't using it since I had my own spices from my mom, and I saw that she was preparing her meal of uh, corn porridge and milk powder. Pretty, pretty bland. So I offered her this spice shaker, she took it from my hand, yanked open the chili powder, and started shaking it in. And I asked the interpreter, hey, is it safe? Can they handle chili? And she said, yes, they love spices, but they can't get a hold of them in the desert. So I felt I had done my good deed for the year in handing off spices to this Himba woman. Further on into the desert, this was the only medical emergency of the whole trip. So I was picking up my tent one morning, and I felt this sting on my middle finger. Flipped it over, and I saw this scorpion with a fat tail. 
and I knew that the fat tail means that there's some strong venom in there. But I thought, you know, I'm a strong biker, right? I'll just shake it off, no problem. Nah. -uh. Within a few minutes, I had a feeling moving up my hand. It was the venom moving up my nerve. And I got scared, thinking, what happens if it reaches my heart? Will I die? Will I get paralyzed? Luckily, there was a couple, a German couple next door. Uh, they saw what happened. They rushed me to the community hospital in town. I burst into the ER place yelling, I got stung by a scorpion, I'm going to die, give me some medicine. And the big nurse behind the desk said, uh, sit down, where's your passport? I'm like, passport? You want to do paperwork now? I'm going to die, give me some shots. But I realized I better not get angry at this woman. She is my ticket to survival through this situation. So I threw my Indian passport and she said, no, no, where's your health passport? I'm like, I don't have a health passport. So she takes out Namibian Health Ministry health passport, and I realized how much they love their bureaucracy, almost as much as we love it here in India. Filled out this booklet. Finally, I was allowed to get some injections that slowly brought the feeling down. But it took about four days before I could fully flex my left hand. And if you ride a bike, you would know that the left hand is really important for the clutch. Sandrina has a really tough clutch on her. And uh, after four days, survived through it, got back on the bike, riding through Namibia, and uh, this is uh, one of these really countries in the world. For one, also that uh, this whole massive country is only two million people. I think there's two million people in Saket only, <laughs> and all of them are mostly in the capital city in Namibia. So it's a very empty country, wild camp anywhere you want. Uh, really enjoyed that. Got down to the uh, southern tip of Africa, Cape Agulhas where the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean meet. And from here, looking at my final destination of India. Sandrina arrived by ship to my parents' home, getting blessings by the Pujari before starting the final leg of the trip. And uh, you know, India was where I thought, right, this is the place I'm finally going to get caught by the cops, have to pay some bribes and fines. Actually, I only had to pay one fine in this whole trip in Nicaragua, random, random thing. I'm crossing Udupi here from Kerala into Karnataka, and uh, these guys go blazing by in their polis, lights flashing, they're waving me down, and I thought, okay, this is pretty serious, I have all my paperwork ready, you know, I can get out of this. They come over, all smiles. They just were curious. They'd never seen a bike like this before. They wanted to take a photo, we took a selfie, and it was all good. Continued on, you know. Rode through uh, the rest of India in the hot summer, saw the Taj Mahal for the first time, got up into Ladakh. And I have to say, you know, after traveling through the Rockies, the Andes, the Alps, I feel I saved the best for the last in the Himalayas. And being an Indian, I'm proud to say, I think we have one of the most gorgeous places in the world right here in our backyard, where people pay tons of money every year to come and see. So if you haven't been to Ladakh, I implore you to go there soon before it becomes completely run over. And a really gorgeous place to see. After Cargill, went down through Srinagar, Chandigarh, and finally into Delhi, and the trip ended at India Gate in June of 2000, about four years ago now. And uh, for the Indian motorcycling community, you might be aware now that in the last few years, the biking community has really taken off. Royal Enfield has gotten behind this and encouraged traveling and trips. And uh, the Delhi biking community was really amazed that an Indian was doing this trip and finishing in Delhi. So they held this rally where uh, 300 bikers showed up with bikers beyond the horizon. And um, I've started giving back to the community by encouraging people to travel more, helping people who have an idea or an ambition to travel abroad by bike, helping them with the paperwork and getting through it. And uh, after that, I launched an adventure travel company, Jamming Global Travels, uh, doing guided motorcycle trips in some of the countries I've been through, Kenya, Peru, Mongolia. And in 2014, crossed from India through Myanmar into Southeast Asia, opening up this trip and also showing other people also how, how, how they can do this. So here's a short video that sums it all up.
Thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it.